All right, thank you. Now, um, you've all heard the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke, but there are two other Christmas stories in the Bible, and you heard both of those. One is from John, which you just heard, and the other one is from Philippians. Those are both the Christmas story. And uh, you're going, Christmas? What's he talking about Christmas for right now? We may find out. I invite all of you to stand and join with me the Nicene Creed on page 880. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with whom the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He was spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic church, an apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Facebook land, I'm so glad you're there. Can you answer this question in the comment section? We're going to get to this question in a couple of minutes, but if you could start, uh, start the ball rolling uh, in Facebook land. And thank you for joining us. All right, where is God? Okay. Do you want to play a game? Last week, we were talking about separating the sheep from the goats. Uh, it's uh, the third parable in Matthew 25. It's the, uh, the you know, if you're looking for a place in the, in the New Testament about final judgment or judgment day, this is the chapter and this is the third parable. Now, you remember Jesus was separating the sheep from the goats. The sheep would go to the right. That means heaven. The goats would go to the left, and that means not heaven, all right? And, uh, and then that's, you know, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and naked and visit you and all that? I, I was thinking about this. Wouldn't it be fun to be the one that determines the goats and the sheep? Who's with me on this? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, I'm thinking, if I was in charge... And I could determine who the sheep and the goats are. I know I'm going to offend some people. Boston Celtic fans, goats! Yeah. New England Patriots, goats! Boston Red Sox fans, sheep! No! Oh, wow, Dodgers and Angels, yes! Lakers, yes. Rams, yes. Where was the 49ers? Where's Carolyn? <laughs> okay. Wouldn't that be fun? People who drive well on the freeway, sheep. Amen. People who cut me off, goats. Especially the ones that pass everybody in that slow line and then cut us off in the front. They're super goats. Everyone who votes my way, sheep. 
Everyone who doesn't vote my way, goats. Now, um, wouldn't that be fun? I mean, I think it would be kind of cool to live my life living, you know, the one determining who's the sheep and the goats. So some of you know that this is AI generated. How many know that? See, all the young people know it's AI generated. Some of us who are old, like me, are going, what's AI generated, you know? So um, I went to open, uh, or chat, I went to get this AI'd. I can't even speak the language. And I said, I want a male who's 70 years old with receding hairline, glasses, beard, wearing a cler clergy robe, shouting goats. And that's what I got. Now, AI contributed to this picture. Can anyone tell me how AI contributed this picture? And it surprised me. Do I? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> hey, you're supposed to sit on that side. No, I'm sorry. You went to the other side. Oh, my goodness. Why? Because you know that this is the sheep side? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. In case you don't know who that is, that's Anna. She's been joining us for the last couple of weeks. All right. Go and say hi to her. All right. It used the singular instead of the plural. Okay, good. Okay, why did you say that? Oh, did you see that? I didn't tell it to do it, and it did it, because it knows I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> I love that. Because see, you know what? Um, even though I'm being silly and ridiculous and saying, you know, hey, here I am standing up going, goat, 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 the reality is I'm a goat as well. You know what I'm saying? We're, sometimes we can get into that idea of like, you know, because see, I don't think I'm the only one in this room that is tempted to play this game. Is that true? You go, oh, I don't play that game except when I'm driving on the freeway. All right. So, so. When I play that game and people outside of the church don't see it as a game, what does that do? If people outside of the church look into the church and see a lot of yelling of goat, what does that do? If people's image of the church is a place where people are inside pointing outward and going goats, would they not be tempted to ask this question? Where is God? Do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody who's like, you know, you Christians, that, that's how the conversation sounds to me when I get involved in it. You Christians... You guys are so hypocritical, judgmental, and uh, pointing your fingers holier than thou. They don't use this phrase. You call all kinds of people goats. Have you ever had a conversation like that? And have you ever wondered how to respond to it? And, and, and when you get deep into that conversation, sometimes you can hear them asking this question. Where is God? Now, we can ask this question on many different levels and in many different circumstances. You know, uh, something bad happens to you, and you go, where is God? You see this tragedy around the world. Where is God? And then if you see the church and some of the things that it does and has been accused of, and you might go, where is God? Where is God? Now, we've been talking about Matthew 25 
And this is a really important chapter. You know, a lot of people focus on, well, this is final judgment day. I like to focus on, this is what we need to be living or how we need to be living our lives now. I, I know about the final judgment, and we kind of read about that in the Nicene Creed, but I think it's something that's really important. So for the last three weeks, we've been looking at Matthew 25, three different parables. And if I was to sum it up, I would say, God, in a sense, judges us by if we are being good stewards of our job. And what we saw last week is our job, each of us is called, each of us has been given talents, gifts, time, resources to go and use those to make the world a better place, to be a difference, to make a difference. So when we see somebody hungry, or when we see somebody thirsty, or when we see some other need, and God has given us the talent, the resources, the skills, then that is what God calls us to do. Now, God doesn't call everybody to feed. God doesn't call everybody to give something to drink. God doesn't call everybody to go visit. God doesn't call everyone to be sick. There are certain skills, and those are just, in a sense, symbols of what we are called. So if we, and, and so, in a sense, the great sin is when we refrain or hold back, that's the great sin. That's not practicing justice. That's not practicing righteousness. Righteousness, justice, is when we go and do what God has given us the ability to do. We need to be doers of the word. So here's the question. It's the same question, in a sense, as last week. We asked, what is a good person? Now we're going to ask the question, what is a good church? And last week, one of the struggling questions for me, and I don't know about you, was the question of a choice. And the choice was, would you rather appear good but in actuality, you're not good. Or would you rather appear not good, but in actuality, you are good? You can almost see John the Baptist in this one, right? You know, from the people who had the power, the clergy and all that, John the Baptist had the appearance of not being good, but I think most of us in this room would agree that he's good. Same way with Jesus, right? Crucify him. They they weren't saying crucify him because he was good. Jesus had the appearance of not being good, but in actuality he's good. In Scripture throughout it, we see that's part of the tension, that we as followers of Christ may give the appearance that we're not good, but in actuality if we're following Christ, we are good. So what does the church look like? And are we willing to, in a sense, would we rather have a church that appears good? but not really be good? Or would you rather have a church that doesn't appear, but is actual, in actuality really a good church? Now, I know what we really want is both. We want to appear good, right? And we want to be good. But we got to ask the question, what's driving us? Appearance or actual? That's a really important question, not only as a church, but as individuals. And if I could kind of like send that out and have us think about it really deeply, it would be very beneficial for all of us. So we looked at the Christmas story in Philippians. If you have a Bible, take a look at this. This is Paul's version of the Christmas story. It doesn't compel us to sing, Oh, come all ye faithful. Anybody like, Oh, come all ye faithful? I love that song. If we don't sing, oh, come all ye faithful on Christmas Eve, I'm going to be yelling goats. (laughs) So now Paul says this. This is, okay, I don't know how to say this right. At the part of this scripture we're looking at, this is the only time Paul is talking. What follows is a quote. Paul quotes something, but these are his words What follow, those aren't his words. Okay, it's really important to make that distinction. So Paul is saying in our relationships with one another, in your relationship with those people, with the people on that side of the room, and the people on that side of the room, 
Your relationship is to be the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That's what we're going to be focusing on today. Mindset. Uh, that's actually a kind of a popular word now. Uh, there are books called mindset. You know, but the idea, or some of your translations, if you have a Bible, might say attitude. Uh, yep. I, does yours say attitude? Yep. Okay. He's got an attitude. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> mindset, attitude, essence, being, how you live. This is how you're supposed to be. The same as Jesus Christ. Well, that's not new, is it? And this, what follows, Paul quotes something very not new. He's actually quoting a, most people, theologians think it's a hymn. Now, we have to pause here. When Christianity started, they didn't write it down immediately. Because basically most people couldn't read. But most people could tell oral stories. And so the Gospels began as an oral tradition. And one of the things that was first, in a sense, shared or passed around is this passage right here. It was a, a kind of like a hymn or a poem, but they would say it together. They'd gather together. Wrong way of saying it, but gives you an idea. It's like, you know, when you gather together, you do the Pledge of Allegiance. When they gather together, they might do this. Okay, does that make sense? So it's something that people, when Paul writes this, they, they've heard this before. Now, Paul, in a sense, is one of the first writings, because Paul is actually writing uh, letters. Uh, and so these letters are really important because uh, they're written down very early in the church. Notice what Paul says when he says that we're supposed to be like Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, right? Jesus, who... Being in very nature God. Some of you might be going, wait, wait, what? What does this mean? In this passage, in this hymn, in this poem, Paul is reciting, quoting the idea that Jesus is in the very nature God. Jesus is God. But he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Okay, I'm really confused. So this is the beginning of an idea that we know as Trinity. How many have heard that word? Okay. So in the New Testament, there are indications that, in a sense, God is one, but there are like three persons sharing the same being, essence, and stuff like that. Uh, that's why it says very nature, essence. You know, there it is, but there's three beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hang on to it. It's only going to get more confusing. Rather, Jesus made himself nothing. The Greek word there means emptied himself. Well, what that means is, okay, we're going to get uh, talk about incarnation. This is the moment of incarnation. Jesus, here he is, divine God, before the birth of Jesus, you know, Jesus down there, the logo says what John will use, and we'll see that in a couple of minutes. He emptied himself in the sense of his divine nature. And taking the nature of a servant, when he says servant, that means human being, all right? Made in the human likeness. So what we find is, uh, as we're going to be coming uh, into this a little bit, Jesus was fully divine still, but also fully human. Fully divine, fully div uh, human, appearance as a person, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, death even to the cross. In some ways, and don't put this on the exam, but in some ways, this is the, the prince and the pauper. Right? Here's this royal prince. He emptied himself in a sense of his royalty and became the pauper. How many know what story I'm talking about? Okay. So here's the royal king emptying himself and becoming a baby. All right. As we continue here, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the nature that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, 
and even tongue acknowledge, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's the, the full hymn. So what we got here is, yeah, he emptied himself, but then we have, as the story continues, the ascension, and he comes back, and then he gets to be at the right hand. If you have a Bible now, turn to John 1. And in John 1, it says this. The Greek word for word here is logos. And logos is... Um, it's, it's translated as word a lot. It's kind of like message or concept or thought. So it's really important to see it as this way. In the beginning was the word, logos, thought, idea, message. And the word was with God, and the word was God. We should be hearing Philippians 2 right now. We just saw this, all right? He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world, wor world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. All right. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. That's talking about us, actually. The next verse is this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. In this verse, it concludes for us that the word that was in the beginning and the word that was God, that word took on flesh. And what is that word? Jesus. This is Jesus. This is another Christmas story. I know it doesn't, yeah, I know you're not really compelled to stand up and sing, Oh, come only faithful right now because the word became flesh. But this is John's version of the Christmas story. The word became flesh, true light, true light. All right. Now, let's take a look at the Nicene Creed. The second paragraph is about Jesus. And it says, We believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son, eternally begotten of the Father. That comes from the passages that we are reading. God from God, light from light. Kind of like what we see in John. True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being, with the Father. Those words come from these two passages. If you put, take your finger and hold it there, and you go to O come all ye faithful, and you go to the second verse, this is the reason why we sang it today. Second verse of O come all ye faithful, true God of true God. Talking about Jesus. This is the birth of Jesus. Light from e light eternal. Lo, he shuns not the virgin's womb. That's kind of like the humble thing. Son of the Father, begotten and not created. That second verse is a reminder of our Nicene Creed. All right. So hang on to all that. There's the, we just did this, the Nicene Creed. And we're talking about the word incarnation. Now this is, this is the important word right now for us to focus on. How many have heard this word before? Okay? All right, good, good. Incarnation. Incarnation is what we've been talking about. God taking on flesh. Philippians 2, John 1. Okay? And we just saw that. So here's our question. And this is an important question for the church today. The question is, are we to emulate Jesus 
as the incarnation, because that's what we just read in Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, take on the same mindset as Jesus, and then he talks about the incarnation. So the question is, are we to emulate Jesus as the incarnation? And if so, what does that mean? Is anybody confused? <laughs> All right. Well, we should be, okay? Because, you know, how do I, you know, in a sense, emulate, have the same mindset, be like Jesus in, as far as the incarnation? All right. So, you might think I'm going loony. And if you raise your hand and said, yeah, you're going loony, you're a goat. No, I'm just kidding. This has actually been a very popular question among theologians for the last couple of decades. Okay, so it's not like I pulled this out of a hat and made it up. I wish I did, because uh, uh, brilliant minds are wrestling with this, and I'm just looking at them. What does it mean, incarnational? What does it look like when the church is incarnational? Okay. All right, let me back up. Oh, that wasn't the way you back up. All right, okay. The prince and the pauper and the incarnational idea can look like this, but we have to look at it in a humble way and not as the prince and the pauper way. Because if you come away looking at it from the prince and the pauper, we go out and like, I'm the royal. That's what we're called, royal priesthood, right? Anybody heard of that phrase? But we need to do it humbly. Okay, what is he talking about? Jesus, in a sense, put his divinity aside, in a sense, and took on flesh. And the reason why, well, we know why, for God so loved the world... We know why he did it, but why did he do it that way? In that passage when it says that he took on flesh and dwelt among us, that Greek word actually means pitched his tent next to us. I'm not saying go out there and go camping. But in that culture, it's like moving next door in the house or the apartment next door. Jesus left heaven and went out into the world. A good church needs to leave heaven and go out into the world. It needs to go beyond the walls of the sanctuary and go out into the world. We need to go. And as we go, we will go in many different ways, as we see in Matthew 25. Some of us will go and serve. Some of us will go and make disciples. Great commission now. But we must go and be, in a sense, pitching our tent in the world. Let's pause. I'm going to put that to the side. Burbank first has a long tradition and a very wonderful tradition and history of going and making a difference in this community and beyond. I mean, it's almost kind of hilarious how well you did it. I mean, after all, one of your pastors was the mayor, you know? I mean, that is incredible, okay? You have made a difference and are continuing to make the difference. There's, there's a YMCA, which we're going to hear about, breakfast. That is being incarnational, you know, it, uh, going and being a part of something that's making a difference in our community and beyond our community, because YMCA is not just in this community. There is HALA, okay, and those of you who don't know HALA, that's a, a, a ministry not uh, that this church is part of. It's part of its community and they they bring homeless people and they get them back into houses. Awesome. There's the Kiwana event, 
Okay? Is that Gala? What's Gala? Gala. Gala and Kiwana. You've had a long history. There are so many other ways that you have made a difference. This is now what's really important, and this is the reason why this is such an important question today. In the last 200 years, I do not know any time in the history of the church in the United States that it needs to be more incarnational. And the reason why I say that is because in the past, culture outside of these these walls was Christian. It was a dominant culture. All right? Uh, Theologians use words like Christendom, you know? And and what that means is uh, things were the common story for our nation has always been either like a Judaism or a Christianity thing, you know, the Ten Commandments. That is a common story. Everybody accepted that. Uh, I find it interesting that all of those rock songs of the late 60s and early 70s, a lot of them had Christian influence. I mean, they would share, you know, um, Spirit in the Sky, you know, it's not like, hey, I'm going to go to church and sing this song. You know, this guy just sings. And uh, um, don't drink from the silver cup. Who sang that one? Oh. Don't get old. Your memory goes. <laughs> but there are all these songs that people understood in the counterculture because they knew what Christianity was. That has been leaving the building. This is really important. So when we continue to do ministry, in a sense, we're doing ministry in a foreign land, even though it's outside of these walls, just just feet outside of these walls. Okay, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Today, we don't have a common story. Uh, People don't all share in a sense, the story that we all know when we're talking about it. Now, I probably have said this before, but uh, you know, when I was in junior high, um, on Monday nights, every kid in our junior high watched laughing. <laughs> every kid. Yep. Yep. See, I got an amen. No. <laughs> on Tuesday morning, you were a goat if you didn't watch laughing because you couldn't participate in the conversation because you didn't have the common story of what happened the night before. So the common story of the Bible that used to be in our culture is no longer here. Let me give you an example of why or how that works out. My parents were devout atheists. Okay, That was first generation. I was second generation uh, atheist. Second-generation atheist is completely different than first-generation atheist because first-generation atheists, they know the common story of the Bible and they just turn their back to it. Second-generation has no idea what a Bible is or a church. So second-generation people, and I've had conversations with second-generation atheists, don't realize that you could go to church without any special permission. I've had conversations with young people who go, so what do you have to do to go to church, you know? Uh, Do I have to get a special pass, you know, or a ticket, invitation, secret handshake, you know? All they, They don't know that you could just walk in, a lot of them, second generation, unless they're aware of the common story. So let me share, uh, this is kind of funny and sad. My, My mother did not want us to know anything about Christianity, a lot. My grandparents, on the other hand, her parents were different. But so I didn't know anything, okay, about Christianity. So when I became a Christian during the Jesus Freak movement, the first time I, the first year I was sitting in church, I would do things like this. They start talking about Christmas preparation. I turn to somebody and go, they celebrate Christmas in church? And they'd look at me like, and then it came to Easter. They celebrate Easter in church? 
Now, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Okay? About 15 years ago, it's Christmas Eve. And, and uh, at Redondo, we had a 7 o'clock and an 11 o'clock. I really like 11 o'clock services, you know, the night, midnight kind of thing. <sighs> My sister calls at 9 o'clock at night because, you know, we would say Merry Christmas. And she goes, Merry Christmas! Where are you? I'm at church. They make you work on Christmas Eve? Uh, it took a little patience to tell her that Christmas is really a Christian thing. <laughs> there are a lot of people, and I was one of them, that, ex- are, that are alive right now that may not know that there's a relationship between Christmas and the church. We live in a different time. There may be people who have never even heard of the Ten Commandments or Moses. And so when the church starts to do its ministry out in the world to make a difference, it is a different different game. It's a different paradigm. And so what does it look like when we do it? And one of the things that's really important when we do it is this passage from Peter, 1 Peter. Because sometimes we get a little um, carried away. Oh, I didn't even use the board today. Whoa. Wow. I thought you were going to rush. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In your hearts, this is like that mindset, revere Christ as Lord. It's just kind of like what Paul was saying in Philippians. Notice what he says. Always be prepared. I would have to say us clergy have dropped the ball at preparing people for what follows. Okay. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that you have. We need to do, us clergy need to do a better job at preparing you, all of us, that when we're out there in the world and someone says, why are you different? Why are you so hopeful? Why are you Pollyanna? What's going on? That we can share with them the story of Jesus or the story of how God has made a difference in our life, that God loves us so much that God is willing to humble himself, take on flesh, die on a cross to restore the relationship. Now, some of us know how to an- know what the answer is, but some of us kind of like give the answer in such a loving way that it's like this. Boom! 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 Down for the count! Ha-ha! Go! Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you know anybody like that. Okay. But what what does Peter say? Do this with gentleness and respect. The incarnational church has to be humble, like Paul says. When we're out there, we have to be gentle. We have to show respect. And, And look what it says. Keeping a clear conscience. Okay. That's really important. So that those who speak... Those who speak bad about us because they're looking at our appearance and they see bad about us or bad about the church. Remember, we have to have a clear conscience so we don't change our style to have the good appearance even though when we change, we become the bad. We need to maintain the good conscience no matter if we have the bad appearance against your good behavior. It's a risk. It's not easy. And we clergy need to really focus on training all of us to do ministry wherever we find ourselves so that when somebody asks the question, where is God? We can do it with gentleness, respect, beginning with the listener and understanding their story. Let us pray. Lord, I think that there are a lot of people outside of the church who are asking the question, where is God? 
And I think the church has now entered a time in the life of the church, in the story of the church, to be the church in the same way Jesus came to us, to humble ourselves, to be gentle and respectful of those who haven't really heard the story of your great love. We are the light that they see. And sometimes they will not see God unless we are of the same mindset, of the same love, gentleness, and respect of God. Oh Lord, this week, slow us down so that we can reflect on where you're calling us to make a difference. In Jesus' name.